If you're joining us today for the first time, this is part three of a multi-part series designed to help introduce and discuss the source material for the HBO show Watchmen. If you're unfamiliar with the story, or like to start from the beginning of a story, you may want to see our episode on issue one. But if you've already listened to the first two episodes, or you just want to start right here, Sam and Scott are watching Watchmen starts now. Alright everyone, welcome to Sam and Scott are watching Watchmen, the show where we watch HBO's show Watchmen. I'm Scott. And I'm Sam. And welcome. Today we are going to be discussing the third issue of the graphic novel Watchmen, which is a source material for the HBO show. And today's episode is called The Doctor is Out. The Doctor is out. Not in, he's out. Woo! He is out. <laughs> How are you doing today, Sam? I'm doing just fine. How are you? I'm doing great, doing great. Excellent. Uh, a little bit of little bit of housekeeping before we get into the old uh, the old uh, you know purpose of uh, all of us being here, which all is right. to discuss the uh, the HBO show. Just want to let everyone know uh, our podcast, Sam and Scott are watching Watchmen, is available. You can follow us on Twitter at at Watchmen Podcast One. There's no T. They didn't give us a T. We didn't qualify <laughs> for a T. <laughs> Where can they email us, Sam? Right. Uh, they can email us at watching Watchmen. Um, at nerdcyclopedia.com. And they can also, um, you know, catch us on TuneIn now. We are on TuneIn. So if you search Ooh. Watching Watchmen on TuneIn, um, you will see, or just search Watchmen, you will see our podcast on that station now. Um, we are now on Google Play. So not Ooh. only are we on iTunes, we are on Google Play and on Stitcher as well. Wonderful. Wonderful. The empire is really coming together all yes, at once here. Yes. Oh, and don't forget to join our Facebook group too. Um, it's Absolutely. called Sam and Scott are watching Watchmen. So just um, search that on Facebook. We're going to have feedback. We're gonna, that's the best way to get information about our posts. If you have questions about the, sh- uh, the story, you want to ask us uh, to address any feedback, commentary, let us know. We'd love to hear from you. Yeah, we sure do. And um, on our regular, you know, Nerd Cyclopedia, you can always just follow us at Nerd Cyclopedia on Twitter as well, just for general comments on um, if you want to hashtag us <laughs> for, if, <laughs> yeah. for any disgruntled, you know, um, comments that uh, we may have that you don't like. <laughs> yeah, anything anything you don't I say that you don't like, please feel free to hashtag hate Scott. And <laughs> just hashtag me hate Sam. <laughs> All right. So before we jump into chapter three, um, I did want to, uh, you know, I've been having my wife actually read through this graphic novel for the first time. Awesome. Um, you know, one of the reasons is we want to make sure that people that haven't, you know, read this book understand what happened in the book. And I feel like, uh, you know, it's a good idea for us to uh, have some feedback from someone going through that. Awesome, um, awesome. Some of the things she said, uh, she read chapter two. Some of the things she said really kind of uh, had me, uh, you know, struck me as interesting. So uh-huh. she noticed there's a cut uh, where it cuts to Adrian's head, and above his head there's a blimp in, uh, in pink. And she noticed that it looked a lot like a, an atom bomb. <laughs> she was like, that looks like a bomb over his head. And I was uh-huh. like, oh, okay. okay. Yeah, that's something to point out, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she likes, uh, she also, and I'm just going to say it this way, she thinks the comedian is a piece of trash now. <laughs> she, read, she read that episode oh really oh yeah so she read episode two and she's just like what so she's reading it and i'm i'm kind of like talking to her about it and she was uh she got to uh you know the first flashback and she was like i don't even i it's like i wasted so much sympathy on the comedian last issue i hate him he's terrible you know oh, he's awful and then i'm just sitting, i'm just sitting there like well there's like there's a couple more flashbacks you're gonna have to go through. wow that's that's really interesting so um i mean before we get into um before we get into things how how does she sympathize with the um, comedian? Why did she sympathize um, before I think she started? Just because he was, I think, just because he was a murder victim. Okay. So she All said right. she saw, knew he was thrown out of the the thing, right? You know, and, and obviously it's her first. You know what I mean? She doesn't have right. the foreknowledge, right? That exactly. someone that an okay. expert, an expert yeah, like it, me or you. It's just have. good to to hear that feedback. So it's, it's really interesting that you know she would get that interpretation just before mm-hmm. she starts reading, um, you know, the rest of it. Starts going into the flashback. So as Little things like that are really interesting to me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, absolutely. She also, uh, she is, uh, uh, yeah. So she is noticing some really important stuff. So she, so I think that it's nice. You know, some of the stuff I don't, I don't think that um, because she disliked the comedian so much when we got to the Moloch scene. 
Right. I think she wasn't interested in his emotional state. She was just like, he's terrible. <laughs> like that's well, all that she it, could it see gives, was how awful he is. It gives the comedian an arc and a character. Mm-hmm. You know, now she knows that you know this guy actually has some complexity to him. You know, so right. she automatically. So and that's a great thing about this novel. You know, graphic novel. Alan Moore puts you know actual input and character into these into these figures, so you can have an emotion. So for having mm-hmm. having that you know striking that emotion with this character, that's awesome. It is, and it's a connection, even if it's not a good connection. Nah, uh, yeah. is a thing, and and uh, and the fact that the character, you know, your your perspective on the character can change like that. Yes, it's something that's really, really, you know, in, indicative of this being a well put together story. Yeah, I'm enjoying, um, you know, hearing her feedback. Maybe we, we we can even get her on a podcast, maybe later down the line, just to you know get her um, comments and everything. So I I feel like there's going to be, you know, uh, not to spoil the plot, but I think there's going to be issues that'll be really good to have her on excellent, later on. You excellent, know what I mean? Excellent. So so I think we can work that out. She doesn't seem to be microphone shy or anything, so I think we'll, <laughs> we'll be okay. <laughs> yeah, you can't be microphone shy coming on here, boy. Mm-mm, mm-mm. Although she will not, uh, I I will. Uh, the one uh, executive decision I will make is there will not be a, a hate wife hashtag. There will be no hashtag. For her. No hate wife. You can direct any of that to me directly. So any anything she says you don't like, go ahead and direct to me. <laughs> that will not be Wait, happening well, on here, guys. So no, no, you know, no. You none will of that. you will officially get the business, even if you yeah. don't do five stars. That'll be the business. That's yes. how you get it. Exactly. That's the number one way to get the business. <laughs> <laughs> Never talk to my wife again. <laughs> Anyway, so a uh, big thank you to her for working with us on this. And yes. uh, it's been really great having yep. that feedback. So thank you so much, you know, for, uh, for uh, you know, providing that to us. I feel like sometimes I lose perspective, you know, for what uh, the story feels like the first time when, when I – it's a piece of media like this that I've just, you know, consumed so many times. So uh, thank you again. I yep. really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you, Alec. All right. Great. So now uh, I think I am ready to begin. All right. Chapter three, which is uh, not called The Doctor is Out. <laughs> We're calling it The Doctor is Out. So chapter three, um, we start out. It's the very first appearance of a couple things right at the out- offset, right at the beginning, right? Right at the outset here. So the very first thing that you hear for the first time right here is the, the Black Freighter. Yes. Right, Sam? Yep. So um, we get into like the whole Black Fre- Freighter. Um, a comment on like um, one thing I do want to comment on with these mm-hmm. actual issues and the chapters start with, uh, you know, a cover of the actual first panel. So mm. that's one thing that, um, you know, I did want to point out throughout, you know, these chapters. You'll see the first panel in the first. In, uh, I'm sorry. You'll see the cover actual, you know, cover or the um, title of the chapter in the um, actual first panel. And then it sort of like sort of pans out. Right. You know, like um, in this third one, you get the um, fallout shelter. And yeah, then so you get, it slowly it, it's, zooms out um, in each panel. It's so neat. It's almost like it's like a movie effect. Yes. You know, so you want to see that that slow pan out. And we're introduced to the uh, uh, to the guys over at the uh, uh, over at the uh, the newsstand. Newsstand, yeah. Uh, which is in Times Square, I think, or close to Times Square. It's mm-hmm. in downtown New York, obviously. Yep. Titled and the judges, the judge of all the earth. <laughs> the judge of all the earth. And um, so uh, we see the guy. The end is nigh. Do shows up, right? He shows mm-hmm. up with his little placard, and he says. Uh, you know, hey, I want a, uh, you know, I want a newspaper. And uh, Gus, well, Gus is the name of the guy that runs the uh, comic store, the, the uh, newsstand. He says, uh, "Is he a world ending today?" He says, "You know, yep. We save my paper for you tomorrow." <laughs> right? He says, "The world's ending. Will you save my paper for me?" <laughs> yeah, that's just it's hilarious. That red, that a red-haired guy. You know, he's just super creepy. <laughs> He's he's everywhere. <laughs> he's everywhere. He's everywhere you want to be, and everywhere yeah. you don't want him to be. Yeah, that's his motto. Uh, totally nihilistic. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, so then we move on to uh, the Rockefeller Research Center, <laughs> and we are treated to uh, the uh, intimate moment shared by uh, you know Lori and Doctor Manhattan, and Doctor Manhattan has made a bunch of copies of himself. And uh, Lori realizes this and is not happy about that. Uh, <laughs> she is not pleased that uh, Doctor Manhattan has made two or three of uh, of himself. And he says, "I thought you would be. In, I thought you'd like this." And then she she says, "No, this is crazy." And then she comes out uh, 
Uh, she comes out of the bedroom and there's a, a Dr. Manhattan standing in the kitchen, like doing science, <laughs> like right there while, while, you know what I mean? Right. Like he's right. distracted his attention and, and, and she's so bad. And, and yeah, she is super mad because number one, she's trying to be intimate with her, you know, you know, so-called lover and everything. And here mm-hmm. he are, here we see him multitasking. So not only does he have two of himself in the bed with her, you know, trying to have sex and everything. <laughs> <laughs> who knows how they're having sex and everything but you know two of him and then he's also out in the kitchen um right you know um, um making coffee and um <laughs> it's just crazy <laughs> and he and she's just you know just like wow you know you can't really focus your attention on me and um during we, that right during that yes, during that du- during that like it's, it's not just normal it's right. like a very specific special time that couples share and uh he's like he's like pouring stuff into a beaker <laughs> He's doing like chemistry. <laughs> so people like, you know, people that are into Watchmen, like the, that type of nerd, uh-huh. you know, like us. I mean, us, basically us. And the people that are, I'm sure, are listening to the podcast. We're all we're all in that. Um, you know, we all fit that Venn diagram. Yep. Um, what differentiates us from people that have like seen the movie and people that are casually fans of this is that we get into Black Freighter. Yeah. So we're the Black Freighter posse. That's what we are. We're the crew. <laughs> <laughs> So pretty much we're the crew of the Black Freighter, pretty much. Uh, I always think that I think that's funny. It's sort of the in joke that we have that the uh, I guess the uh, greater Watchmen community has. Right? Mm-hmm. So that's really neat. Um, so so Dr. Manhattan and Lori are having a fight because Dr. Manhattan can't stay focused during <laughs> during sex. And he it's, can't see. He, it's like she it's like he's cheating on her with science. It's all. Much. It's also a good metaphor about <laughs> how <laughs> men just can't stay focused. Period, and everything. Here, he, here he is. He's just breaking himself up, and you know, just um, doing different things. And she wants, like I said, that you know, intimacy. She wants that focus right. and everything. And uh, right. how many times have men complained about women just not focusing on them? <laughs> and then, it, and then he has he has the gall to be like, if you believe there's a problem with my attitude, I'm prepared to discuss it. Like, who's, <laughs> <laughs> like oh my goodness. <laughs> I really. That's, oh man, <laughs> Doctor Manhattan boy. Uh, he he's uh, so it's also interesting. You know, you see him. You know, this this you know, sex is a very human thing. Right. It's based on it's procreative and it's it's you know it's something. I, I'm not going to get into what you know specifics on this, but you know it's something you guys that, I guess know most the of us enjoy. Of these if you um if you're listening to this podcast, did we not put a family? We put a family friendly tag on this. Or we, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm calling it PG-13 at least, right? I mean, this movie, this book <laughs> is not a uh, this book is not a rated G comic book. Not at all. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like not at all. Not so at all. I feel like it's okay for us to say the word sex, right? Uh, and discuss it in a mature way, but. Uh, no, I can't do that. I'm not capable. Of doing that. <laughs> uh, it's interesting because this the, sex is a very human thing, yes. and chemistry is a very non-human thing. It's something that ha- you know what I mean. It happens in in you know space without anybody looking at it, right? Right. And it, the fact that he's he has to interrupt himself, uh-huh. you know, he has to interrupt his attention. Like the sex isn't enough for him. It's not enough for him to pay attention to. He needs something else, right? You know, so he can feel fulfilled. So he can feel like he's not wasting his time, basically. Yeah, he has and his own needs. Yeah, absolutely. He has his own needs, and they are not related to Laurie in any way anymore. Right? Like, he, he, you know what I mean? He's sort of moving on from you know from that tether that he has to, to humanity. And anyone who's seen The Matrix Two knows that a hero needs a personal tether to humanity. That's how <laughs> the architect said, "These of you love the architect." I mean, put that little. Yeah, they had crappier PCs than we do now. I mean, thanks, thanks a lot, technology in the nineties. <laughs> mm-hmm. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, so Laurie's mad. She. uh she is very upset with John. She says she hates him. She throws the beaker at stuff he was working on. He phases it goes through him, <laughs> smashes on the counter, says, I hate you. She leaves. And John just sort of reconstitutes the beaker. He kind of like like turns back time and the beaker's fine. Yeah, basically just puts it back together. So yep. mm-hmm. and we see Jenny Slater. Now Jenny Slater is Dr. Manhattan's um, ex girlfriend. And uh, she made an appearance in the last issue. She was the other girl that was with Dr. Manhattan at the Crime Busters meeting right. in the 60s. Uh, so she's shown up. And uh, she's, uh, she's telling this magazine that she has cancer. And she's saying that she thinks Dr. Manhattan gave it to her. And she's saying, like, nobody's going to miss me. I don't have any illusions. She's like, I'm smoking four packs a day of those weird cigarette things. Like, you know, I don't know what they are. Little balls. Like a, a glass pipe. Uh, uh, my my wife thought those looked funny. She was like, "What is she smoking? Like, what is that?" <laughs> and I was like, "I guess it's a cigarette. I don't know. I don't ask a lot of questions about about that sort of stuff." 
Yeah, um, I guess, so I she's guess at a style the, cigarette or whatever. So yeah, style. <laughs> <laughs> it looks different. It so looks kids different. can't you can't get mad at us. Your kids can't buy it, so it's right. okay. <laughs> But hey, like, look, for people that weren't around in 85, a lot of people smoked a lot more in 85 than they do now. Yes, so. they did. <laughs> the different uh, different mores back then. You could smoke like in the mall in 85, right? Just walking around. Oh, I was watching the um, 80s thing on CNN last night. You know, it was mm-hmm. like an 80s retrospective and stuff. And Robert Downey uh, Jr. was smoking on TV. I'm like, oh, what? Just on TV. That is that is different. That just shows you how, the, uh, how different it was back then. So mm, <laughs> The 80s were a crazy time crazy time so uh jenny's at uh, nova right it's like the, the magazine called nova uh-huh. and she's talking to an editor and Lori. so Lori leaves dr manhattan now and she goes over to dan dryberg's or night out too just as a, a reminder mm-hmm. and she has as feeling an itch uh for heroin uh for being a heroine uh, anyway uh and uh they go to visit uh hollis mason and they basically uh get accosted by a gang of top knots that's the name of the gang and they beat him up real, real good. Like they just uh, the the gang did not pick the right target. Yeah, night. they 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 sure did not. <laughs> so if we were talking about Batman tendencies, <laughs> you know, walking into the middle of an alley in a dark night in a dangerous city, mm-hmm. and then just provoking, you know, not provoking anything, but basically saying if it happens, it happens. Right? That's a Batman tendency for sure. I'm pretty much, you know. I'm not saying you're going to turn into Batman if you do that. <laughs> but if you're the type of person that does that sort of stuff, there's a pretty decent shot. You could develop into a Batman later. Yeah. When, um, uh, one thing I did want to comment on, you know, mm-hmm. when he, when we go to Jenny Slater talking to the um, magazine. Yeah. One of the first things she mentions is that, um, that, uh, Dr. Manhattan was adequate, adequate sexually to her. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, so this is right after, um, you know, Lori, you know, the, the fight with Lori and everything. And that's the first thing that's mentioned as far as, um, you know, um, um, how, uh, how out of touch in humanity, uh, how out of touch, how his humanity was out of touch, even with her, you know, mm-hmm. and these panels, um, for pages six through six and seven are mm-hmm. juxtaposed with her and um you know with Lori leaving dr manhattan you know going yep. you know to the street to um drivers and everything intercut with um jenny's you know jenny slater talking to like the magazine and everything so i thought that right. was pretty interesting too um and then um like scott said you know we get to her we also see <laughs> this is little stuff little stuff within the panels we get to on um, page eight where um um uh, the the locksmith is putting that lock back on that Rorschach broke the previous issue. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, he's fixing the he's fixing he's, it. And what's the name of that? What's the name of the lock company? A Gordian Knot Lock. The Gordian <laughs> Knot Lock Company. Now I don't know. Well, that's important. I'm just going to put it that way. My fraternity did a lot of stuff with the Gordian Knot. So uh, you know, Delta Sigma Phi Beta Iota. You know, I'm just uh, thumbs up to you guys. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> that's the reference, by the way. Alan Moore was one of us. No, I'm just kidding. Right. He's not. Uh, not a member of our <laughs> organization. So, so, so we we get that little um that little tidbit right there. I thought that was pretty decent. Um, and then like Scott said, you know, Lori's talk. Lori basically seeking some sort of humanity. She's seeking a see first. She's seeking attention, and she's seeking some comfort and some um. <laughs> Some some someone who can actually relate to her, and pretty much since Driver was a um, Mac, my mass avenger, you know that's the first place she comes to. You know she just mm-hmm. had dinner with a guy, and so she she goes to him and basically you know talks about <laughs> talks about superheroes. You know. Yep. Yep. And uh, the other thing is, you know, you notice, you know, Dan's in the kitchen, right? Mm-hmm. And he's making he's he's like taking care of her needs. He's catering to her. He's making her tea or coffee, and he's getting out of sugar cubes he only has one sugar cube left because rorschach stole all his sugar cubes <laughs> right it's just it was just kind of funny he's doing the exact opposite of what dr manhattan was supposed to be doing you know exactly obviously he's human he's diverted he's giving Lori all of his attention right now right. and he's instead of using some you know glass beaker in the kitchen to do some random sciencey sort of thing he's all focused on getting her some tea because he you know she's cold <laughs> so, uh, that's 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 Dan. He's definitely interested in Lori's needs. 
Yeah, even if he's not, you know, that. openly trying to, um, you know, I guess flirt with her or whatever, you know, he's mm-hmm. tending to, they, they're giving, a, they're both giving each other what exactly what they need in that moment is. She needs his comfort and she needs, he needs to feel that he's actually helping her out. Mm-hmm. He need, I think sometimes Dan Dryberg, you know, Dan's an interesting character because uh-huh. he's sort of like, you know, he, he gets into superheroing because... You know, he has all this money that his parents left him. Right. And, uh, you know, he, he asks Hollis basically for the uh, the permission to become Night Owl again. And he's a little different. He has, he's a gadgety sort of superhero. Right. Um, his Batman tendency. <laughs> his Batman tendency is to build gadgets and have right. them all be, you know, re- weirdly specific, like, uh, motifs. <laughs> so he's an owl and <laughs> Batman's a bat. That's the difference, right. essentially, right? Uh, so really, really nifty. But he's, you know, he, he's looking for a purpose. Like, I feel like that's that's Dan's thing is he's always looking for a reason. Like, why are we doing this? Why right, are we doing this? Right, why are we doing this? Right. Mm-hmm. Like, even with the comedian in the second issue when he's like, who are we protecting them from? And what mm-hmm. happened to the American dream? Like, he's the one thinking about these things. Yeah, yeah. You know, and not everybody's doing that in the story. Yeah, everybody um, has their, their their flaws and, like, you know, um, you know, things about them. Dan is, Dan, this is Dan's thing. You know, mm-hmm. and like you said, he's he's looking for his sense of purpose throughout like the um throughout the story. So it's inter- it's interesting to see where he begins and to where, you know, to where they end up. Yep. And it's interesting to see how, you know, I feel like there's a tension between these two, like a sexual tension between these two characters, like a chemistry, mm-hmm. which again is interesting, which is another. I mean, you keep saying these words and you keep I feel like I keep thinking, oh, my goodness, it's just like how he was doing chemistry in the, in the Rockefeller right, Research Center. Right, you know? right. And. And, uh, you know, you think about that stuff, it seems like what really, you know, makes Lori, Lori sort of reciprocate a lot of that interest, a lot of it, uh-huh. in a serious way, is when they have that encounter with that gang. Yeah. And, and she sort of sees, you know, she sees them in action, and she's sort of, you know, am- they're all sort of amped up and adrenaline up, you know? Yeah, I don't think, I don't think, did they really team, I mean, uh, I, I forget, but did they really team up back then? You know, I know they were um, both part of the Crime Busters, but did they solo team up or, you know, when when they do start fighting, the, um, you know, that gang and everything, it does heighten the tension and, you know, everything just start flowing through both of them. And mm. basically, Lori's getting hot. <laughs> you know? Yeah, she really it's like it's almost like I, I jokingly said she has an itch for heroin. Right. Like I wrote that and I remember writing it and being like, that's because that's how they like for these guys and especially for, for Lori. It's almost like an addiction for them. Like they, they're almost like adrenaline junkies, you know. They're seeking yes. that thrill of, right. of, of the thrill and doing something good, right? Um, at the same time, and uh, you know, usually punching someone in the face is not something you get a lot of, you know, accolades for, right? Like that's not something in a, most contexts. If you hit someone in the face, it's like, you know, you get booed and like you're not supposed to do it. All of a sudden, like, right. okay, fine, right? Like, fine. I guess I'm not supposed to punch people in the face, whatever. But the thing with Lori yourself. is, is that um. She doesn't really want to do this, but b- mm-hmm. because she has a training, this is what this is all really she knows. You know, all she right. knows is about superheroes or, um, you know, mad, being mass adventuring because that's what her mother um, brought and taught her, um, you know, brought her up to be and everything. So when she comes upon this situation, I mean, she is instinctively knows what to do. But mm-hmm. she as we find her going to like her, her mom in the previous issues. And her going to Dryberg and, you know, in doctor, uh, her dealing with Dr. Manhattan. This is not something that's normal for her. You know, that's nothing. Mm-hmm. That's so, it's not something that she really openly wants to deal with because but because it's in her already. You know, it's just it's just a thing. It's just a thing that just automatically kicks in when she, um, you know, happens upon this gang. And like I said, everything the, the adrenaline in, in them both start popping up. Mm-hmm. And the other thing, you know, about Lori uh, in this situation and what's different contextually from where she's been for the last, I mean, at least the last 15, 16 years or so. Right. Is, you know, she was essentially, doc- I mean, if you think about like their life as a comic series, like, I, and, you know, if you think about it like that, uh-huh. he was essentially the comic, the hero, and she was like the sidekick of that relationship. Right. Right. Because he is capable of doing a lot and mm-hmm. she's a human being. Right. Like she has a, that limitation, essentially, that he does not have. <laughs> yeah. So anything it's almost like you ever watch a Justice League cartoon and you're like, well, all that's going to happen is Superman's going to show up and punch dude in the face and that'll be it. That's it. Yeah. Right. So Dr. Manhattan's the Superman that punches people in the face. He has Superman tendencies. <laughs> yes, that, that's a great way to put it. Great way to put right? it. Right. Uh, and so so her she's getting involved. So her like contributions to this fight are meaningful. And that's something she's probably not really used to. Mm-hmm. Uh, and to, and to kind of piggyback on what you were saying, so uh, Lori's mother Sally was the most um, 
she was the most ready to monetize her position as a master adventurer. Right. That's what she was known for. And it's, it's discussed in the Under the Hood, too, in the second part of Under the Hood, I think, right. maybe, um, where they're talking about the end of the, uh, the Minutemen in right. the 40s. Um, and so she's very keen on that. So she knows that there's money to be made at being a master adventurer. And so she wants, you know, part of the reason that she wants her daughter to take up the mantle of Silk Spectre isn't just to carry on what she was doing. It isn't just to, you know, because the world needs protection. It's also because she knows there's a way for us to make some money here yeah, <laughs> on this. She, she was thinking about her, her future and everything. I mean, it's natural for her being a mother to think about that. So to um, mm-hmm. to lead, you know, that life and to um, have the foresight, you know, forethought to, um, you know, do that. That's, 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 I guess that's a pretty good thing on her end, even though it's an odd way of doing it. Most parents, you know, they just save money and <laughs> to get, get a regular job but she right. was actually thinking okay well i can actually make money off this and my daughter can too i'm sending you to batman tendency college <laughs> we're gonna teach you how to beat people up i'm not saying you're gonna end up a batman there's a decent chance you could though some mm-hmm. of our graduates have gone on to become batman <laughs> in the past uh you know so so uh, that's that's sort of the, to juxtapose like dan and john and their relationship to Lori, how they how they make her feel right right so that that's sort of uh, so dan makes her feel like she's in danger. Like there's something she's risking. Right. And John really never does because he, you can't, he's, he's got Superman tendencies. You can't do anything to him. Right. Yeah. I mean, and basically, um, unlike Superman though, you know, John is, uh, as we just keep saying is slowly losing his, losing his grip as far as his, you know, sense of empathy, you know, how he Mm -hmm. feels. And, you know, through these panels, just before they get to, um, fighting the, you know, gang, they're going back and forth, you know, um, um, if you just look at the um, panels, um, mm-hmm. um, Dr. Manhattan is looking at her bra and on page nine, mm-hmm. you know, he's thinking, who knows what he's thinking, but he's looking at it, contemplating maybe like, you know, what is this? Why is this? You know, um, and he slowly, you know, tele- you know, telepathically, you know, te- um, puts on his clothes and everything and decides he's just going to get dressed and go to this, um, I guess, TV station. Is that? Yeah, he has like an interview scheduled. Like yeah. on, it's like mm-hmm. uh, like Phil Donahue or Ted Hopper or someone like that right. is interviewing him on TV. And it's going and, back uh, and it's going back and forth between um, that and um, Dryberg and Lori, you know, talking about, um, you know, talking about. Uh, you know their 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 life and times and everything. So, mm-hmm. um, I mean, just imagine it as if it was a this was a movie and it's you know going back and forth between um you know between the scenes and Lori is pretty much narrating everything while Doctor Manhattan is basically getting dressed and you know doing his thing. Yeah, and when he looks at that bra, I'm almost thinking that he's like he's like oh clothes. Like, like this is a silly thing. Yeah. And he's got to dress himself and he's almost thinking like, what is this? This is no, like, there's no purpose to this for me. And he sees Laurie's clothes and he can tell, like, he knows, you know, Dr. Manhattan can kind of see the future yeah. and the past and this mm-hmm. present simultaneously. So, you know, he knows like the outcome of this fight before it starts because he's already experiencing it. It's, it's. Uh, it's it sort of um, a, makes a mockery of cause and effect in a way that is, has to be magic, I guess. But I also um, think too that um, throughout like the novel, when he when 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 he looks at that, I mean, really, essentially, he has no reason to look at that bra like that. Um, mm-hmm. If he knows the uh, past, present, and future, and everything, I think it's something that he's learning, you know, as he goes along, as far as himself and everything, mm-hmm. because he wasn't like this when he first. And we'll get into this, you know, later in the whole Dr. Manhattan chapter. But when he first actually changed into, into Dr. Manhattan and everything, um, he's yes. learning and realizing more about himself as he grows on and realizes that none of this matters. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Because and it's almost like he is like these little tiny things, you know, for him, it's almost the same thing like the comedian was saying in the crime buzzer. <laughs> thing. It's right. Like, eventually, it's not going to matter because this cataclysm is going to happen. It's going to wash away, you know, everything. Right. So this is this temporary, like like this, this, um, this bra is almost like a symbol of this temporary, like the temporary fragile nature of humanity that he sort of like contemplates now from afar. He doesn't participate. Right. And, uh, you know, he's, I would point out his, one of his Superman tendencies is, uh, that he has a Lois Lane because she's talking to the press, but, uh, uh-huh. he kind of goes through Lois Lane's a little bit. He's not exactly as loyal as Superman. <laughs> Superman <laughs> not, not, not really, not really. So. so what happens when you don't grow up under uh, Pa Kent's uh, tutelage, <laughs> right? You just you know, you grow up on a, you know, but we'll get into Dr. Manhattan's past and uh, all that yep. stuff later. So um, as Lori and um, 
um, Dryberg are fighting the criminals and everything, or you know the gang and stuff. Um, Doctor Manhattan is at the studio now, and right. they're trying to get him together. And you know um, they tell him to darken his um, his his um, skin color um, yeah. so he could look better on camera. You know because they said they're gonna put him in makeup. <laughs> he was like, what? and then he goes, "Is this better?" <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, it is better. <laughs> That's exactly what we were gonna do, and he's like, "Doctor Manhattan." I will always imagine Doctor Manhattan sort of giving the thumbs up and then walking right in the studio after mm-hmm. that, like, "Cool, man." Right, you know what right, I mean? right. And then uh, as the um as the um fights start going on with the um with the gang, um. Mm-hmm. That's a type of tension that's ratcheted up between, you know, Dryberg and um, Laurie in the studio. There's a, um, a tension that's rising up as well, where, as soon as, you know, Dr. Manhattan is on camera. You know, the host starts asking him questions and then, the um, you know, audience starts asking him questions and starts. Um, and this is really key, too, because it starts, you know, he, they start pressuring him, you know, pressuring him. You know, the tension right. in the studio is 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 juxtaposed with the tension of. You know, Lori and um, Dryberg, you know, going up up against the gang and everything. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He's fighting, and it's 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 like Doc's fighting everybody. You know, like he's fighting the questions off. One one thing that's that I think is so funny. It's so so funny is mm-hmm. when he when he gets there and the very first thing. Well, I don't know if it's Ted. I don't. I can't remember if it's Ted Koppel or they say who it is. But he says, uh, "I have to say it. What's up, Doc?" And then Doctor Manhattan goes, "Up is a up is not a concept that can be defined," <laughs> and it's just like, "Oh my god, up is in a relationship concept and thus has and thus is meaning." It's like he says it's meaningless or something, and everyone's just like, "Uh, the, hey, that's like that's imagine that's how good. weird just that would be." Like if they got uh-huh. like if someone's name was Doctor Manhattan, right? Uh-huh. And they grew up in you know uh, you know what I mean. They knew about Looney Tunes because they grew up in America. Uh-huh. And you said, "What's up, Doc?" And they just kind of blankly stared at you and, and said, "Well, up is a relative concept. So defining what it is is something that cannot be done as an objective fact." And you're just like, "What? <laughs> like, this guy's what, on what, TV?" That, that that reminds me of um, Alexa. I got Alexa, so you know, you, right. you ask Alexa the same question, you will probably get the same answer. You know, so hmm. <laughs> you know, it's, it's 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 funny how you know you point that out, and he really mm-hmm. goes into the definition of that. I mean, that's basically sounds like a computer, right? You know, right. He, he sounds like, yeah, he sounds like Siri. You know what I mean? He's like broken. It's like, like I asked you, it's like, hey, uh, you know, yeah, Siri, a question. And she gives you the literal answer instead of the figurative <laughs> one you wanted. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it, it's, it's, it's kind of annoying. So it's like, you know, so yeah, so it's just more of that. Like where, like what is left of the guy that right. he was, you know, and it's, and it's, and Dr. Manhattan, and, and, and this is something that, you know, the, I think the graphic novel makes very clear at this point. He's someone be, that's very important to the security of the United States. Yes. And they are relying on him as sort of a bulwark against Soviet aggression. Right. And that's one of the things that it's also funny is they tell him not to talk about Afghanistan. And the first question is about Afghanistan. It's like <laughs> that uh, is 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 it's funny too. Just um, I mean, now that you point that out, how naive uh this version of America is about mm-hmm. the standing with Doctor Manhattan. You know how they um depend on him as his, as a secret weapon. Like you know they can control him, and we'll see how that develops. You know throughout the um mm-hmm. you know throughout the graphic novel here. But yeah, the first question is about <laughs> Afghanistan. <laughs> And what does he say? He's like, what are you going to, he's like, what are you going to do about Soviet aggression? And everyone's like, yeah, what are you going to do? And he goes, there are no matters in Afghanistan that require my attention. <laughs> that's it. Like, that's what he said. I, I always picture him sounding like the Moon Knights from Aqua Teen Hunger Force. I don't know why. I just think it's a, that's just how I hear his voice. I'm going to go to Mars. You know, I'm going to leave. You can't make me do that. I don't know if he was being like that. Right. Um, and um, so like we were saying, you know, the tensions are ratcheting up and everything. Um, the mm-hmm. questions are being asked and he gets confronted with um, the um, from the Nova Express writer <coughs> or a writer mm-hmm. from the Nova Express about um, about Wally Weaver. Now, we didn't really talk about, um, you know, Wally Weaver yet. Well, but... that's because Wally Weaver hasn't really shown up yet. Exactly. Like as a character. So, so you know, again, you know, for readers, this is. The introduction of the idea that Doctor Manhattan has a friend named Wally, <laughs> right? And he's and he's been dead for a bit, <laughs> and he's dead. And right. we find out he died of cancer back in 1971. Yes, um, yes. you know he remember. You know, of course, you know Doctor Manhattan. You know, remembers him. And um, um, the writer, the the writer, the reporter um, comes at him with more people. You know, that died mm-hmm. of um, you know cancer, like you know Jacoby, um, also yep. known as Moloch, who. Um, um, the comedian had visited 
And then also yep. talks about who else here? Uh, Janie, of course. You know, we just talked about mm-hmm. Janie back in the um, previous panels, you know, going to, um, you know, Nova Express here, which is, you know, dictated here. Yep. And so Janie, the, Janie is, is very bitter against Dr. Manhattan because the, their relationship did not end well. Right. Yes, 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 yes. She was not. And, it, and, it, and it, when, you know, not, not to not to read ahead, but it's sort of understandable that she'd be mad. Like, yeah. I, you know, I'm sort of on her side about being sort of mad about <laughs> Yeah, I mean, not only did we see that, you know, in the um in the previous issue doing the crime busters, he was flirting and everything with um you know um, um Lori, you mm-hmm. know, um we find out <laughs> later. I mean, and we know how that ends, right? <laughs> like we, we know, we, like it's not like that's a secret in the story. <laughs> <laughs> he ends up he ends up with her, um, and then all of a sudden, you know, she finds out she has cancer too, and he might have been a cause of it. Oh my goodness! Mm-hmm. I mean, how I, I guess how would you feel, you know? Um, but I mean, all this, all this idea, the idea that Dr. Manhattan is dangerous because mm-hmm. science is dangerous. Right. Um, you know, and, um, it's interesting that all this is happening at a time when it seems like tensions across the globe are getting ratcheted up too. Right. So and things are not going great for humanity <laughs> as exactly. in this reality. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's, um, the world is. As 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 we go throughout this not you know graphic novel, everything just gets it's just ratcheting up. You know, everything's just es- escalation, as 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 they call it. Mm-hmm. So, um, Doctor Manhattan doesn't really know all this, and we were talking about you know, um, Doctor Manhattan knowing about the past, future, and present at the same time. This right. is another point here where he doesn't. When the reporter confronts him about Moloch and Janie, mm-hmm. you know, he says he doesn't know about that. He didn't know about that. So are we to figure that um, at this point he's not in, in, in as far as an all-knowing being about past, mm-hmm. present, and future, are we to infer from this that he's not at that point yet? I, 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 I suppose it's interesting, you're, like you say, I think that, that we're to understand that that because of um, that he's having trouble seeing his own future a little bit. Right. And he says, doesn't he say, I can't really see far because of some sort of interference that's, that right. he's getting. Yeah. That'll be later. And they ask him. Yeah. Yeah. So, so he's having trouble seeing, seeing his own future. So that's why he's surprised. That's why he's able to be ambushed by all this information here. Right. And he was aware that Wally died. Cause he, he says, Wally was my friend. So he right. knew Wally died of cancer, but he wasn't aware that Mullock had it or, right. Or that Janie had it, and Janie is is Janie there? Like Janie's there, right? No, like, Janie, this, Jan- not. Janie is not at this. Um, <sighs> That's just the movie. I'm so dumb. Uh, and, and, we'll, and, and we'll get into um, we'll get into that. Anyway, so no, <laughs> Janie is not at um, not at the um, the thing at this point. Um, and then the uh, the military intelligence dude is like, <clears throat> like, can you imagine this is like, imagine this is an event on TV, right? This would be just like. You know, this would be crazy. So Dr. Manhattan is this, he's the hero of America. He's the reason basically America is able to maintain world superiority, right? Right. So he's he's like this, he's probably, you know, the most important person in the world. He's probably more important than the president, right? Yes. You would think. And he just comes in and they do this question and answer series to kind of put everyone at peace. And he is just so alien and bizarre. And he's answering questions like, like I said, like, what's up, doc? Well, up is a relative. Like, come on. Like, that, you have to get that joke. He <laughs> seems inhuman. And then, and then all of a sudden we find out he's killing people, right? Accidentally. Yeah. Yeah. He's giving I mean, people cancer. So he's dangerous. Yeah. Or, I mean, at least that this is what they're inferring and everything. So it hasn't been actually proven yet, but right. they're, they're, they're asking these questions and these theories are, you know, pretty much relating, you know, back to him, you know, well, maybe he's the cause of all this and everything, you right. know, being him being such a, um, you know, pretty much like a hydrogen bomb, a living hydrogen and, bomb or whatever. Um, and so, literally after the third question, basically, <clears throat> they're like, that's it. It's over. So it lasts like three minutes, right? Mm-hmm, that's it. Mm-hmm. Like, that's how long it is. It's not like it, it goes on for an hour and then it cuts off. It cuts off like right away. And, you know, the networks would have been priming this up and promoting it and talking about, oh, tomorrow night we got Dr. Manhattan Q&A. You know, it's going to be on CBS. It's going to be a big deal. Tune in. And then it's over in three minutes. And it ends like, and it ends the way it ends, right? Right. Which, which we can get into, which, you know, this, this is the next thing, right? Yep. After we're done, we talk about the question. So, so, doc, so they start pressuring him and the guy says, oh, the interview's over. And then everyone starts yelling questions at him and crowding around him. And he starts, and he, and he says, and he like yells, right? What's he yell? He yells, um, what's he yell, Sam? You got it in front of you? I don't have to. Yeah, yeah. He says, no, it, please, if you don't, uh, if, if you let me through, you know, he'll, um, I guess, I guess he was about to say, you know, he started talking about, but, um, Eventually he says, um, please, everybody just go away and leave me alone. And this is, this is, 
uh, we, Dr. Manhattan is losing his grip on empathy, empathy and humanity, but they mm. pressure him so much he gets to a point where he does react, where it's just too much pressure on him, and you know he tells everybody leave him alone, and then he finally screams, you know, at the end, leave me alone, and everybody mm. disappears. Everybody he makes everybody disappear out of the studio, and yep. this is in juxtaposition of Laurie and um. Dryberg's fight just ending they just you know kicked the gang's asses and everything and they're like you know coming down from their adrenaline rush so uh -huh. as this is happening at the same time of Dr. Manhattan just booting everybody out the studio yeah and as he said with empathy like we know that it's not a fun thing to be teleported right like it doesn't feel good because it makes it makes Lori throw up every time he does it she uh -huh. says like oh it's all disorienting it makes you feel terrible <clears throat> So, you know, it's, it's sort of like that, you know, so this, it does kind of harm people a little bit, right? It makes as far as like nausea and stuff. Right. But he, he just sort of zaps them out of there and then the, and then the, the broadcast cuts out, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, he says, like, they, what does he, uh, Hollis eventually says, he sent him cameras and all out in the parking lot. Just put them all outside. Yeah. So, um, yeah, um, we get, um, Lori and, you know, Lori and Dryberg going back to, um, you know, leaving like the alley and everything. Why do you decide mm -hmm. to go down that alley? I don't know, but <laughs> I, <laughs> I know <guess> why. <laughs> I know why. It's because they're addicted to heroin. <laughs> they're into heroin, right? They're into being heroes and heroin. That's so the they go, they go into whiskey places, you know, <laughs> this happens in Dark Knight and Dark Knight Returns, right? At the very beginning, uh -huh. Batman, and this is a Batman tendency. Batman goes in the alley and says, come on, do it. That's good. You know, he starts threatening the kid. The kids are like, this guy is like, uh, this guy's a bad idea. Right, 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 <laughs> we right. We don't right. want to mess with this exactly guy. right oh so man. he's into it i'm not into so so it's that sort of a, a thing you know mm -hmm. you if you're in a dangerous city and you you know you like to punch people in the face might as well go to a place yeah, where you, you can know, punch somebody and, in the face. And, and you know you could take care of yourself and everything so going down an alley like that you know knowing mm -hmm. it might be potential danger i mean what's it to it you know it's still a shortcut you're trying to get home easier i guess absolutely um, so yeah they're um they're they're leaving they they, they leave each other um dan mm -hmm. goes back to his apartment and um, oh yeah, like you say, he's he. I guess he's going back to um to Hollis Mason's apartment, right? Yes. Yeah, he's going to visit Hollis. Yeah, he's going to visit Hollis. Yeah. So um yeah, Hollis talks about <laughs> the Doctor Manhattan incident on TV and how everybody just disappears, and you know this is being broadcast <laughs> around the world, guys. So you know that would be we're, so we're seeing, unsettling. Yeah, we're seeing it from the perspective of Hollis Mason. So imagine imagine seeing this actually you know play out on um you know all the screens and tv in 1985 mm -hmm, mm -hmm. no internet no no social media or anything like that all you have is the context of what you see on television which pretty much you're believing and 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 it's all and it was all this was all done to allay your fears like the whole point of setting this whole thing up was to to you know get people to calm down about the tensions right. between russia right. and the soviet union and the united states and all that happened is they got Ranch, ratchet it up even more and uh, no one knows what's going on with dr manhattan right right and, and, like and, they and, don't know what's going on with him like he's and, just he's a, a sort of a rogue agent now yeah and, and we're um we're to interpret you know that this guy is unstable so we thought we had mm -hmm. a protector you know americans had a protector with the dr manhattan and everything now you know he's ratchet he's um hit with all these questions and you know finally breaks down and makes everybody disappear so what are we to think now <laughs> you know mm -hmm. about uh dr manhattan he's unstable and um you know he's uh, like scott said it's just make it's just everything's just compounding on top of each other yep and the question is can you even you know if, if i'm a you know if i'm a farmer in iowa and this you know can i trust this guy to be right. you know what i mean to take care of, can i trust that you know is it can i justify like i think about how that would justify such an aggressive foreign policy and now all of a sudden, the thing that's allowing you to do that is, is knocked out from under. Your pins are knocked out from under. You'd be all off balance, right? You'd be leaning mm -hmm. way too heavy on, you know, on on arrival when all of a sudden parity is restored. Right. And it's, it's immediate and there's no warning, right? Right. And right. so all of a sudden, you know, if, you know, when Dr. Manhattan goes, you know, and he's and they can't find it. They don't know where he is. Right. Uh, when he goes, you know, the, the Soviets are going to see that as a window of opportunity for them, right? Yes. Like if he comes back, all of a sudden the status quo is restored and the Americans have superiority. But while he's gone, there's parity, and now they can now they have to move. You know, it's a strike while the iron's hot. Take it, uh, take it, take advantage. Mm -hmm. You got to take advantage of that stuff. So, you know, tensions are going to be exploding there. Uh, you know, I think they tell they tell Nixon the Russians are preparing the nukes. Right? They say that to him here. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, they go. They're quarantining Doctor Manhattan. The, the military has decided to quarantine him. Yeah, just just before we get to that portion, oh, yes. um, um, you know, they go back to the black freighter, 
um, you know, oh, captions. And, mm. um, you know, with uh, and it'll just keep going back to the newsstand guy and the black um, the black guy that's reading the um, comic book. <laughs> right. Mm. His newsstand pretty much for free. You know, right. the, 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 the funny thing about this is um, the, the newsstand guy just he loves to talk. You know, yeah. he 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 want he he loves to, um, you know, just to, to, I guess, you know, hear himself talk and everything. The the guy is not paying attention to him. You know, mm -hmm. he's reading his comic and everything. And, you know, not uh, the Black Freighter comment, um, not really wanting to be distracted like that. But the, right. um, the new scan guy just keeps talking, talking, talking. And, you know, we get his perspective of things um, along with um, this comic within a comic, you know, the Black mm -hmm. Freighter. Yeah, and it's a it's a pirate tale, you know, and uh, it's about revenge and murder and you know all sorts of great stuff. And you know they they kind of talk they 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 touch on this later, but essentially pirate pirate comics are the big deal, you know, in right. this reality. Superhero comics aren't really a thing anymore because of how silly right uh, the superheroes ended up being, other than one. And yeah, it was I mean, terrifying. why 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 would you want to read about superheroes when it's it's a a, a real life thing <laughs> and it's just uh, you know. <clears throat> it, it's not so much of a fantasy when you the reality is right in front of your face. So uh, exactly. we we see we see the um, newsstand guy, you know, getting his interpretation or his perspective, I should, I should say, of what just happened with Doctor Manhattan. He talks, mm -hmm. uh, he says cancer. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. you know, he he's a, such a conspiracy theorist. That, you know, you know, he's he's just saying, okay, you know, I I should have known that. You know, it's, it figures that you know, you know, this guy, this um, this super being or whatever causes cancer. And they should have deported him <laughs> or put him in exile like a long time ago and everything. It's like a, it's like he's pretty much saying, I told you so. I told you so. I told you. Right, so. Of right. course, he didn't know anything. You know, he's no. he's just, you know, just loves hearing himself talk so much that, you know, this is what he speculates and stuff. And he's <laughs> he's is pretty much saying that, you know, a guy like him is ready to believe anything that's out there. Right. You know, and and make up his whole is his his own. Um. um his own, you know, judgmental way of th how things are out there, you know, as far as that. He's got a worldview. He's got a worldview. He's got a worldview. And he's very, you know, he, like you said, he's very, very talkative, really likes his regular customers. Mm -hmm. Apparently deals with the redheaded and then does not a guy like all the time. <laughs> he just deals with them all the time. Um, and is this where he, sell is he sells him a paper? And he says, the world end yesterday. And he says, no. And then the redheaded guy says, are you sure? And the, what's his, the, uh, the caption says... Uh, what does it say? Like Doctor Manhattan's gone. Yeah, and then um, just before that, um, before we get back to the Manhattan being you know quarantine, right, right, you right. know the um, the newsstand guys pretty much says in this world, you shouldn't really you shouldn't rely on any help. You shouldn't rely on help from anybody, and, and a man stands alone. That's mm -hmm. pretty. That's pretty deep, you know. Yep. Um, and then like Scott said, you know, we, we go to the, um, you know, dock back to Dr. Manhattan's and we see, you know, the quarantine thing. Yeah. And he, what's he, he teleports in, in his suit and he tells the dude, I'm going, at least he says like, I'm going to Arizona and then I'm going to Mars and he teleports out and he leaves his suit. Like the suit just goes, <laughs> he's gone. Yeah. It's no sense in having this anymore. I mean, he's pretty much, um, everything that happened at the studio pushed him mm -hmm. to this point. You know, we found out that he's landed here cause he teleported out of the studio, you know, mm -hmm. into here. And, um, you know, the government is just on it quick. So they realized right. that Dr. Manhattan is now a danger all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah. He's you know? not a hundred percent controllable, malleable. <laughs> the things that we've been doing to keep him under control, like building him an apartment, giving him research funds, letting him do science and, uh, you know, giving him, you know, basically making sure Lori stays there and is happy and doesn't go anywhere. All that failed. So now we're going to try something different. And Dr. Manhattan is like, oh, you're going to try to build a prison for me. Uh, it, bye. No, no. He just says know, bye. It's, it's just not happening. So, you know. Also, and I'll, put, I'll point this out. Dr. Manhattan doesn't wear clothes for his own benefit. Like, he doesn't need them. They're right. not for him, right? Right. right? He wears clothes for us. Yeah. So when he much. goes out and he's wearing clothes, he's doing, he's putting, on, like, that's almost like putting on the glasses and, you know, and, uh, you know, for Clark Kent. It's kind of like that and being bumbly. Right. And, you know, here he's just like, mm, shedding that. Whoosh, Gone. I don't I don't need this anymore. Why do I even wear clothes? What's the need for clothes? You know? I don't need this. I don't need you. That's what he's saying. I don't need to I don't need to, you know, put on a facade to make humanity comfortable. Right. And um, why does he go to Arizona again? He goes to Arizona because that's the Gila Flat. That's uh, a Gila Flats base. Uh -huh. it's, uh, it's it's tied in with his past. Right. And he goes to get a picture. Ah. He gets a picture of a man and a woman eating popcorn. OK. And then he looks at it. And he teleports to Mars. 
So this is key, and we will get into this next podcast, <laughs> next mm-hmm. episode. Yes. Um, you know, he looks at this picture. This is his, um, pretty much his, um, this is a, 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 a way of him still connecting with humanity. And he looks mm-hmm. at it, puts it down. Oh, no, does he take it? No, he actually does take it. You know, he mm-hmm. takes it, and he's off to Mars. Off to Mars. So, yeah, everybody and all this stuff and plot done. <laughs> so, the doctor is out. <laughs> he's gone. Uh, hence the name of today's podcast. There you are, everybody. That's the name. The I doctor mean, is out. He's out. Um, all right. And then um, we're back to the um, the Black Freighter again. You yes. Know, and um, the the newsstand guy, the, you know, the guy is reading the um, you know, the comic on a in the you know next to the trash can on the ground. And again, we see your friendly neighborhood redhead guy. You know, he's <laughs> <laughs> friendly, your friendly neighborhood prophet of, dis- of doom and destruction. He's always you know, just like every neighborhood's got one of those. Right, right. He's always getting that gazette because you know, um, um, the 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 news guy could just keep chiding him. Is the world indie yet? Is the world indie yet? You know. Yeah. <laughs> so um, it, go, it goes back and forth, you know, between that and the comic. And, um, you know, then we see Lori again. Yep. Lori is going back into uh, her apartment. And all of a sudden we see these um, the hazmat people, government people taking everything from out of her apart, uh, their apartment, the U.S. Army. And telling her exactly what happened with, um, you know, Dr. Manhattan. Mm-hmm. And they want to give her a cancer scan. <laughs> give her a cancer scan and she can't live there no more because I don't think he's coming back and she's sort of not the uh, not the important one of the duo <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Like, you can't you're out of here all of a sudden she doesn't have a place to live either you know so no. Dr. Manhattan that was the reason she was the reason why um Dr. Manhattan was there you know so now they don't really need her anymore yep they don't what's she gonna do they had her there to keep Wasterman under control you know what I mean he's gone Dr. Manhattan I mean had him there to keep him under control uh and so, uh, and then, the, like you said, with the black freighter. So the thing he, uh, the thing at the very end. So, uh, so Rorschach gives that copy of the Gazette to, to Dryberg, right? Gives him a copy of the Gazette. It says Doctor Manhattan leaves Earth. I mean, of course, he it's like I, I broke your lock. <laughs> get, get a good lock. Don't get a cheap lock next time, right? Is what he says. <laughs> right. And uh, and then we find out after the uh, he lets um, he lets the the kid take the copies of the black freighter, and then the headline of the. Uh, the, the reason, uh, uh, what's uh, Gus or whatever his name is, the, the newspaper guy, so out of sorts is because the headline of the paper is Russians invade Afghanistan. Yeah, this everything is escalating. It's just, you know, just craziness. And um, one one thing, um, you know, he says before before we, you know, leave this, this scene, this panel, is that, um, you know, he remembers there was a Superman, a Flashman, um, you know, it says back in 39 before the real mass men showed up, superhero comics were enormous. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, you know, their appeal eventually wore off. So we get this perspective of essentially what, um, what was stated in, um, Hollis Mason's novel or, right. you know, or, you know, bio and everything. Um, <clears throat> this is, you know, this is another perspective of, of what happened with, you know, um, superheroes and comic books and everything. Well, you go, you read these things for escape and it's not escape if, if it reminds you of the news, you know? Right. Exactly. Like if I read if I'm reading a superhero comic and something parallels or echoes a real world thing and then you know the superheroes aren't able to do anything about it and nothing changes and it's exactly like what happened in real life then it's sort of like eh you know well you know no good uh, so you would imagine that uh, seeing a uh, reading a comic about Superman and how like the world gets destroyed by an asteroid but it's okay because there's another another world or something like that right and Superman couldn't save you could see how that would not be <clears throat> not have the same sort of resonance that it does in our in our continuity right exactly where there is no Superman. And, you know, Superman not being able to stop a meteor from crashing into a city is sort of like, well, sure, but we don't have Superman anyway. So, <laughs> so you know what I mean? It's like, oh, that meteor is going to crash into the city no matter what. <laughs> yeah. And, um, yeah, I mean, and, and um, like Scott said, the, um, you know, the guy is, you know, just shaking up when he sees the, the Russians invade in Van- you know, Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. And then we cut to um, Manhattan, um, Dr. Manhattan on Mars. And then we are also, um, it's juxtaposed with Nixon. Yep. And the government, you know, talking about what's happening in the world now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's it. And that is it. You know, Dr. Manhattan sits on a um, rock on um, on Mars and shall not the judge of all Earth do right. All the Earth do right. Genesis um, chapter 8, verse 25. 
Yes. He looks at uh, um the picture of the mm-hmm. guy and the um lady and it looks like a, an amusement park. Yeah. And then um you know we will talk about that next episode. But there's a lot a lot about a lot of answers coming about who he is. So the next you know this is something that's going to be a fun it's a fun episode actually. Right, right, there's a right. lot of that would probably be a pretty long one actually because there's going to be a lot of. Uh, there's a lot of like uh, events that happen over the course of that that kind of you know shed light on some of the things we've seen before in flashbacks and yep. and really explore some of the differences in the in the chronology of their universe versus our universe. Yep. So it's really the ep- chapter four is going to be really 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 neat. I really hope everybody comes and joins us for chapter four. Yeah, and just hope that um you know you guys are you know that are following along and everything are you enjoying what you're reading so far. Um, mm-hmm. This this end it also ends off with um, you know some more pages from Hollis Mason's book Under the Hood. Mm-hmm. You know we get some more perspective of you know things that were happening back then back in um, forty seven. We see um, Sally Jupiter Mary's um, looks like a tycoon. Is that it? Um, right. Sh- Schenecter? Schenecter. Schenecter. He's he's her agent. Oh, okay, okay. He's the okay. one. He's the one who really like <laughs> helped them monetize the Minutemen brand ah, and like okay. sort of helped them create it. Mm-hmm. And she marries him and retires from. Uh, from superheroing what's interesting is you know we're finding out about all these characters and who they are and what they do right Mm -hmm. and they're all disappearing and we're getting introduced to them after they've disappeared right you know so we're reading about all these characters that have already been at our you know we're finding out about you know dollar bill right right now and how he was a really nice guy and he's dead you know and the story's already over so we're reading about these things post facto right so it's super you know it's, it's just an interesting like structure you know, it's a it's a neat, it's a neat way to kind of put that together, so that you know what we're feeling is like, man, I wish I would have seen some of that stuff, right? Like, oh man, this sounds like cool stories. Mm-hmm. Uh, I kind of wish I would have seen them, but what we're getting is like, you know, the you know the after effects. So like, well, at the after all the cool stuff happened, we were still sitting around like it was just a locker room, and right. you know, eventually we just realized it was sort of pointless, and we left and we quit. <laughs> Um, looking at this little chapter, little section of the chapter, you know, he talks about how, you know, Sally Jupiter, Jupiter talked to him about, um, you know, her daughter, you know, eventually mm-hmm. being born. And she wants to, you know, grow up and actually be a superhero and just like her mom, <laughs> right. you know, uh, this the, a childlike wonder, you know, if and this is really um once Lori eventually as an adult finds out that's not what she really wanted to be, you know, she just wanted to do what her mom was back then, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and he says, you know, it seems as if <clears throat> being a novelty nine day wonder, the superhero has um, become a part of American life and is here right. to stay for better or for worse. We know that's not good. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> that's not what it's supposed to be. But um, but yeah, this another perspective of how um, from the under under the hood, you know, in this mm. um, in this last chapter. Anything else you want to comment on regarding the underhood portion? Um, we find out that Lori was born in 1949. Mm-hmm. So we find out about that here. So we can know her age definitively, which, um, I guess there's some more to talk about there. So she's, so in the, in the main story arc, she's like 36, right? I think right. she's about mm-hmm. 36 years old. Um, I, so they kind of keep all this stuff really grounded. Um, as far as, you know, we just sort of find out that everyone sort of just disappeared and, 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 and a lot of the things that happened to the Minutemen characters sort of echo things that happened to the comic industry over the next 20 or 30 years after, you know, the boom of the gold era. So after World War II, there was sort of a drop off in the comic industry and there was not as much of a demand for that sort of content anymore. Right. And there was a bunch of like governmental regulation with the Comics Code Authority and like mm-hmm. they thought it was promoting things that they found that they thought were immoral um, like communism and, you know, uh, you know, there was too much like Nazism into going and beating up people that you found to be criminals. Right. And so there was a lot of societal pushback against superheroes in real life during right. that time frame. Right. Um, so what, what this does is it echoes that in an artistic way to show how, you know, essentially like if you were, if you were living in a, in a comic book, right? Like if I was living in justice league right, and the writers decided to cancel the Flash, like the Flash comic book. Right. The way I would experience that as a character is the Flash would die. And right. He would be gone. Right. Right. So what we're almost seeing here is like, is like these characters are experiencing this, like that sort of thing from the inside of their books. Right. And they're all dropping off and going away and no longer having these adventures because their books aren't being published anymore. Right. 
So it's a really neat, like, it's another neat spin and twist on, you know, on how, you know, our reality interacts with their reality and how, you know, it's a nice artistic way to show that, you know, what sort of outside forces were impacting comic books and superheroes in general during that time. And, um, you know, to, 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 to expound upon that, um, up until this point, you know, as far as like under the hood, you know, um, um, Mason talks about his adventures with, you know, the, you know, the mass adventures. They weren't called superheroes. You know, superheroes mm-hmm. were just still within the books. So right. when, the, um, you know, he starts to get into like when the 60s um, was, you know, when the 60s began, um, um, the arrival of Dr. Manhattan changed the world. You know, right. and it made the whole term of mass hero and costume, you know, costume adventure, you know, as, you know, obsolete as a person that they describe. So, mm-hmm. you know, you know, he starts talking about the existence of the um, or the what how the world interpreted Dr. Manhattan when, you know, when he first began. No one could believe. Just imagine. Just imagine a world where Superman existed. Or Superman was, you know, you was told there actually is a Superman. He could walk through walls. He could fly. He could, you know, make things disappear, reappear and everything. Mm-hmm. How mind-blowing that would be. And this was back in the 60s when this happened within this world. So um, um, to the point where people were thinking that <laughs> the, the the news that was presented to them was their own government. So they were in a uh, uh, thing of, okay, well, maybe this, is, it, it, this might not be something that you believe until, you know, they gradually got to a point where they couldn't accept the actual, you know, blue man and actually seeing it for themselves. So he, he really goes into like the depth of how, um, how it was interpreted. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, Howard was the the realization that um there was actually a Superman that um um you know the idea of the first superhero being Dr. Manhattan. Right. And he and uh Hollis also uh you know, one thing he touches on here in Under the Hood is that, you know, it's an answer to the Batman question, which is why does the Batman not kill the Joker, right? Mm-hmm. Like that's that that's a question that, that haunts haunts me personally, uh, as someone who feels like he should he should probably do it because it would be a good idea. But Hollis says there's no villains anymore. Right. Because we beat them and we put them in jail and they stay there. Because right. jails are not easy to get out of, right? Like, you can't just break out of prison. Right. <laughs> so when you put when you bust Moloch, he stays in jail. He stays <laughs> he doesn't in come jail, back. you know. I mean, eventually, you, though, the, the, the villains are going to go away, you know. Yeah. Or people are just going to realize, okay, well, they shouldn't do what they do. <laughs> yeah. So, like, if you are, you know, if you're, a, if you're competent at cleaning up the crime, you, you win and then there's nothing for you to do. So, like, these guys, like, these crooks, and these crooks also realized, like, they were attracting this attention with these costume vigilantes, so they stopped dressing up themselves, right? Right, And, right. Uh, you know, one thing, one thing that, and we didn't touch on this earlier, so I'll bring it up here. Mm-hmm. Hollis, in one of his earlier Under the Hood, says that it didn't actually start with masked vigilantes, right? Uh-huh. It started off with masked criminals. Yes, And so yes. that's how it starts. So gangs would get a mess and then they leave and you can never tell who did anything, right? So people, they were getting off and they were getting away with crimes and stuff. Right. Mm-hmm. And so Hollis realized, you know, this can go two ways. And so that's that's part of the reason that they started. So it all, it all sort of, you know, spawns from the fact that without that sort of primary mover, because right. the villains were the primary mover here, they just sort of drift apart. Also, he says he met. Also, I think he says he met Doctor Manhattan and he met Ozzy at a thing in 1960. Right, he meets them at a charity event. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So he meets them and talks to them, and he says, you know, he doesn't feel like he is. You know, I mean, he feels like this is a new. These are new people. Like this is a new. Like Doctor Manhattan is just impossible, and and the fact that he exists is is impossible, and he exists. Yeah, I mean, they they pretty much said that as as if Santa Claus was. You find out Santa Claus is real. Right, no. <laughs> <laughs> and then he like shakes your hand, and you're like, "Oh my goodness!" You know, I'm shaking his hand. You know what I mean? And, uh, and we know, you know, that that doctor, you know, there's being around Doctor Manhattan does give you weird physical sensations too, like as far as static electricity, and like he, you know what I mean? He looks different, he, so it's a, uh, you know, he's a. Uh, I guess uh, he inspires awe is probably the way to think of it, right? That's what he does. Yeah, one 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 thing section I did want to read here. So he says the emotions that um a comp- a comedy. Uh, the emotions that accompanied the announcement were perhaps harder to identify and pin down. There was a certain elation, um, alluded to the fact I was talking about Santa Claus being real, mm-hmm. um, coupled mm-hmm. with um, and complementary to this was a terrible and uneven sense of fear and uncertainty. While this was hard to define precisely, if I had to boil it down into three words, those words would be, we've been replaced. Mm-hmm. 
you know so they were doing the costume adventuring for so long all of a sudden there's a superhero now they don't need us you know <laughs> <laughs> we've been replaced by the superhero so um i guess maybe in that time they were figuring maybe it would be more that that may that may have popped up but dr manhattan just changed everything right and then and so it's just totally different he feels obsolete and he looks at everybody and realizes that the the you know the the nineteen you know the, the Minutemen who are still active, whether it's the comedian who's just being like you know in everybody's face and obnoxious and smoking cigars and stuff, or Mothman who's drunk, mm-hmm. or Metropolis is getting old and he it, you know Metropolis is getting old and fat and even though he's doing all his exercises still and so is right. you know, so is Hollis he's getting old he says that's it I gotta quit, he decides to open up a, a car lot and then he writes. Under the Hood, which is sort of like the big expose on on all of the uh, the 1940s superheroes in New York mm-hmm. and what we've been reading for this whole time. So he writes that in 62. And then he, he gets a letter from a nice young man who liked Night Owl and wants to borrow his name and Hollis visits him and finds this fabulous technology and, you know, uh, says this will be the next, you know, it seems like he's seeding this, well, this will be the next generation, you know? I love how... He tell they. I love how they use the. Um, this section is like a, um, you know, a, a Easter egg slash like you know, um, thing with the story. So we see right. Hollis's perspective of when Dryberg is, you know, um, as that little boy, you know, wanting right, to be right. the, um, you know, night out, night out. But we actually see the, um, at, you know, the um, the future events of how that came about, or how that, you know, what eventually happened and everything. So this mm-hmm. is, it's, I just love perspectives, you know, from one version to another medium. So you got right. a novel novelized version, but then you got the comic book version within the same, you know, the same medium and everything. So I yep. thought that was pretty interesting. Um so it's, the, a, it's a memoir of a character in a graphic novel, oof. right? It's a graphic novel character's memoir. So it's, a, it's again, that's, it's the way it, that's nested in there. So neat. And, and, and it, this wasn't done, guys. You know, back in 1985, this is, this is new. This is yep. not, before this happened, you know, you weren't having comic books, you know, um, this complex. So <laughs> you're, re- you're reading something pretty special to where it's commonplace now. Um, mm-hmm. Back in 1985, this was as complicated as it got. If you think about the Batman TV series from the '60s, uh huh, like that's essentially what comic books were like. Right. I mean, that was a very that was a pretty. Uh, they pulled that and put it on TV. Right. And, and they used it to color, and they made it look like how they looked. Yeah. And they had the same tone. They had its tone, and it was like funny and light. And there were consequences, and things would reset to how they were at same bad time, same bad place. And that's just how the stories were told, and that's how you know because they were marketed to children. Right. But you know what. What Alan Moore has seen is that this is also just a, it's a, it's like myth making for modern for modern audiences. You know, like these are right. this is an Olympus that we right. have here. He treats it, and he, these characters he treats as if as if we're finding out about you know about them. You're, it's it's like he's writing a myth, like he's writing like for for like Greek mythology or Norse mythology. It's so neat. Right, yeah, it's, it's, it's just so decent. I mean, like um, Scott said, I mean, Batman, you know, it wasn't meant to be real. So to take him seriously, why would you take a, a person that puts on a bat costume seriously? How can you, right. if you really look in, the, you know, just think about the concept, uh, uh, how idiotic it would be or how insane it would be for a person to put on a mask, jump around at night, beat up criminal, uh, you know, criminals, um, and have his own secret identity and everything as the Batman. That right. that doesn't make any else of sense whatsoever. But yet, especially when you consider that he has all that he could just be making changes by running for mayor, right? Or just cleaning exactly. stuff up by being like, oh, "You can't corrupt me because I'm a billionaire." Right, right, right. right? I mean, he could just do that. <laughs> but he chooses <laughs> to, to put on a mask and break the law every night and everything. You know, do well, what you the know, police what, <laughs> doesn't do. Batman, I guess. when he was younger, had mm-hmm. a lot of Batman tendencies. <laughs> just spending time in caves. <laughs> you know, he was training his body to take physical revenge on the world. Oh, man. You know, he had a terrible traumatic experience. You know, had the ability to, it was, a, it was really, really smart so he could make gadgetry. So Batman is the, you know, when you think about the Batman tendencies, Batman had, they're pretty extensive. Ah, oh, super extensive. And it's, um, they're, they're, um, Moore, Higgins, and um, Gibbons are really breaking in. And that's the deconstruction of this whole novel and every, you mm-hmm. know, graphic novel of how crazy it is to to really think about a, uh, a person putting on a mask and actually going out there fighting crime so right, right. um yeah and that's where we ended um the final thing um i did want to comment on is each 
part of the graphic novel, you know, the 12 issues ends. It ends uh, um, with the first issue not having anything but a black a black background with a clock at the bottom. Mm-hmm. And then each 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 novel that each graphic each each graphic novel each chapter that ends is is the blood slowly coming down, you know, yeah. slowly descending on the um on the clock. So eventually at some point, you know, that blood is going to cover the clock and I guess we'll see how that goes. It's another yeah. element <laughs> that you have to look at that that time is slowly, you know, ticking and, you know, bad things are happening. So, you know, tension is ratcheting up. You know, we start off with um, the comedian dying. And now we're at this point. You know, Dr. Manhattan has left the building. He is out. <laughs> He's out. The doctor is out. The doctor is out. Hey, guys, see you um, next episode. Again, talk with us, um, um, you know, on social media at Nurse Cyclopedia and also definitely at Watch I watch men podcast no t one one podcast um, one um leave you know feedback with us on watching watchmen and nerd cyclopedia you know send us an email if there's something you want to hear about if you have a comment or especially if you've noticed like an easter egg or something we missed you know if we have an error a mission you know you want to hate hate scott hate sam let us know watching watchmen at nerd cyclopedia.com Yep, and um, follow us at, um, you know, um, like I said, on all the social media. Like I said, we're on Twitter, iTunes, um, Google Play. Um, definitely visit our website. You know, we got some content on there as well. Mm-hmm. And uh, we definitely appreciate you, you know, listening to this podcast. Um, look for us on Facebook at Sam and Scott are Watching Watchmen. Join that group because we like to get the instant feedback, you know, from you guys as well. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, um you know, we shall see you guys next episode, and we got a lot to talk about. So we're enjoying this, and hopefully you're enjoying listening to us talk about it. Absolutely. And just a preview, next week we're going to be talking about, you know, uh, a lot about Dr. Manhattan next week. So if you're curious about what that guy's all about, we got some answers for you. Stay tuned. Stay tuned.